Yeah. So there's another contrarian stance that Tucker and many at Fox News take. They deny that climate change is caused by humans and is playing a role in the escalation of extreme weather events. A frequent Fox guest is Stephen Coonan, who recently sat down for an extensive interview with Tucker Carlson on his daytime show called Tucker Carlson Today. Coonan is the author of a climate denial book titled Unsettled, and he's usually introduced on right-leaning media as the Obama scientist because he served as a Department of Energy undersecretary for science during that administration. You're watching a lot of Fox News, Julian. Are you okay? (laughs) Have you noticed it's having an effect on me? I'm going to try and mellow out on that. A Scientific American article from this uh, this past June that I will include in the show notes points out that Kunin was hired under Obama precisely because of his contrarian views, so as not to have a homogenous agency all marching in lockstep is a a weird idea, but there you go. The article also points out that the climate denial arguments Kunin has been making since at least 2013 have all been roundly debunked as cherry-picked distortions of the data. But hey, he's a former professor of theoretical physics. Here you go again with the contrarian adjacent expert, which leads uh, another host on Fox, Larry Kudlow, to introduce Kunin as his mentor on climate science. (laughs) Now dig a little deeper into any of this and you'll find that there really is a climate disinformation industry here in full swing. It's heavily funded by the Koch brothers, oil companies, and others, often using dark money tactics to hide where it's coming from. If they can create a public perception that climate science is an unsettled question, well, then how could the mean old government impose environmental regulations on the biggest job creators, even as half the world floods and the other half is on fire? Now, the big fish in this climate disinfo sector is conservative think tank, the American Enterprise Institute. They've so far received $380 million from the Cokes to spread messaging that downplays climate science so as to keep those short-term profit margins booming. As an example of how this works, Mark Theason, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, wrote a Washington Post article in May touting Steve Coonan's distortions of climate science as he promoted that new book, right before Coonan's June appearance on Tucker Carlson Today. The Washington Post headline from Theason read, An Obama Scientist Debunks the Climate Doommongers. Is this just Charles Koch? Because David died in 2019. So I know we reference the Koch brothers often, but is there, are there other family members involved or is it just Charles who do you know who's as funding As far it? as I know, it's just Charles, but I'm referring to them as the Kochs so as not to have people think I mean Coca-Cola. <laughs> and also because they have they have multiple you know companies and subsidiaries and shell corporations. There's a, there's a whole thing going on there. But yeah, fair comments. In 2007... The American Enterprise Institute was exposed by The Guardian as having sent letters soliciting scientists at $10,000 each, plus travel and accommodation expenses, to critique the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's fourth assessment report. This was a massive endeavor that gathered 6,000 peer-reviewed studies from 130 countries over the course of six years. And The Guardian, quite rightly, characterized these actions by the American Enterprise Institute as a form of bribery. I'll also share a link here to the excellent DSMOG database, which identifies the legion of think tanks, lobbyist groups, and individuals responsible for worldwide climate disinformation. This extensive database is divided into the following sections. They have a climate disinformation section, an agribusiness section, air pollution lobbying, and then an entire area of the website dedicated just to the Cokes. So compared to this incredibly coordinated actual conspiracy, our anti-vax disinformation doesn't are minnows in the shark pool. There's a website by the Union of Concerned Scientists that lists the top 10 offenders, including American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the Cato Institute. And in every single case, they found that huge funding comes from the Cokes and from ExxonMobil to keep climate skepticism pumped into the public conversation. The Union of Concerned Scientists also has an eye-opening disinformation playbook that they've identified through their analysis. I'll let interested listeners read further via yet another link in the show notes, but here's a quick overview. This is really nicely done. Uh, Number one, the fake, passing off counterfeit research as legitimate. 
Number two, the blitz, harass scientists who speak out. And I should say for each of these uh, steps in the playbook, they have several case studies that they link to. The diversion, manufacture uncertainty about science by just asking questions where none actually exists. Number four, the screen, buy credibility through alliances with legitimate organizations. Number five, the fix, manipulate public officials and processes. So there's got to be there's got to be another one called the rapture because there's an ex, <laughs> there's an accelerationist movement that actually wants things to burn, yeah. isn't there? Isn't that part yeah. of it? Or is this is this but but this playbook is doesn't cover that that uh, religious territory, does it? Doesn't cover that, but there's definitely an intersection there. Bill, Bill Morris wrote an incredible article about this quite a few years ago about this idea that if we can accelerate towards some kind of apocalyptic doom, it will hasten the appearance of our Lord and Savior, right? Before recording, I tweeted something just to the effect of, do the young people who are part of the, uh, my immunity is strong, I'm young and healthy, it doesn't really bother me, do they think they'll never age or that they won't need health care down the road, say, during another pandemic when they can't get some other form of health care because there's an overburdened system at that time. And that's why we, you know, keep referencing collective action. And your segment here made me think of the, uh, along parallel lines of those photos that came out this week of the border patrol guy on the horse chasing down the Haitian immigrants. And it's, he's grabbing a guy who's holding two plastic bags. And if you put that into perspective, that's all he has in his life. He has escaped an island and then traveled hundreds of miles to try to live somewhere he can actually live. And you got this guy in the, the imagery was just stunning. But my question is is along those lines, like how long, what happens when Americans for them to start to recognize that we're going to be those refugees at some point, at least in certain areas of the country. And when that happens, does the recognition ever happen that our habits, every one of us has created that, or is the blame just going to be pushed off somewhere else? Where does that blame go? And not, not only are we all in this together, but one way or another, we, we do get to uh, change roles with one another uh, in ways that are often unexpected and un- unpredicted by the kind of privilege that makes us think we're sort of floating above it all and immune to that. I want to reiterate something I said earlier, which is this is not a fun topic to talk about because we are all implicated and because it's going to affect all of us. And I know we'd rather look away from this topic and not really address it. And I know it's a heavy topic, but there, especially with, again, Matthew's interview with Daniel, it's coming up and the resources were including the links. There are a number of people who are working on solutions. If there's anything that I am hopeful for from the younger generations, as much flack as they get for perhaps their social media practices or Tide Pods or the latest one I just found out about today, which is swallowing magnets, and then they have to have their intestines cleaned out. Um, For all of that flack that happens on social media, there are a number of people who are born into this world and being like, what the fuck have I been born into and are trying to do good things? So we'll link to some of them. There are charitable organizations. There are places to direct your time, effort, money that could actually make an impact. And I want to again, point out that looking for representatives that are going to try to enact either the Green New Deal or something like it, rather than getting caught in these ground wars that are happening all the time, is going to be what where our hope lies. Uh, because if it's not there, if it's not done through legislation, we are not going to hold the corporations accountable. We have no say in what they do. If they're private corporations, it has to be done legislatively. And until we start actually supporting people who are trying to make that change, then then these conversations are going to keep becoming more dire and more pessimistic. And I personally don't want to have those conversations a year or two from now on this podcast. Mm-hmm.